Welcome to Fit Body Lifestyle, the show where we dive deep into the world of fitness, health, business, relationships, and the art of living a balanced life. I'm Jamie. And I'm Greg, and we're here to give you the benefit of our experiences in the fitness and bodybuilding industry, the corporate world, running a business, personal development, and building healthy relationships. Whether you're sweating it out in the gym, hustling in your business, or seeking balance in your everyday life, you're in the right place. So lace up those sneakers, grab that water bottle, and let's get ready to transform our minds, our bodies, and our lives. Hi, and welcome back to Fit Body Lifestyle and Greg and Jamie. Today, we are going to talk a little bit about setting yourself up for success in competing. And we're going to start with something beyond that, which is our belief and our experience that bodybuilding is not life, but bodybuilding can make your life better. So as we talk about some of these components of setting yourself up for success, part of what we also want to do is talk about how those choices and those items also are replicated in your personal life and or your professional life, um, career-wise, relationship-wise. So, and again, you know, that that's just kind of our focus of fusing those things together so that you can see that, yeah, the lessons I'm learning here can translate to something else. So maybe the first part we start with in setting yourself up for success in this competition world is a coach. And Jamie, you're the best coach in the industry, and of course I'm biased, um, but uh, when you were competing, you selected a coach. So Talk about maybe how you went about that and what guidance you would give for other people looking for a coach. Well, and I think there is the question of whether or not to hire a coach even. I have always been one that when I want to take on a new endeavor, I want to learn from somebody who's walked in those shoes before. So I'm a big believer in coaching, and obviously I am a coach because I believe in it. And I've um, there's been several other hobbies I've picked up in the years, as you know. That I the first thing I always do is say, you know, do my research to find out who who can teach me in this particular area so that I can become the best version of myself. Um, so when it comes to selecting a coach, doing research is really important. So first of all finding out who's out there, um, what what kind of results are they producing. Um, if you can talk to some of their clients, I think that's a really great thing and see whether or not they had good experiences. Um, certainly you can read reviews, but I think getting a chance to communicate and it's amazing even reaching out to somebody on Instagram or Facebook or something like that. And a lot of times people will respond if you just ask them a nice question. Hey, I'm thinking about your coach. What is your experience with them? And you might even make a, a friend in the process. So that's kind of a cool thing to do. And then after you narrow down the coaches you think are potentials for you, then you need to do a consultation. And the thing I always tell people is like, that is your chance to interview this person before you hire them. And it's really important to see do your personalities click? Um, I feel like if this person's not willing to get on a phone call with you, then I would nix them right away. And I know there are some coaches out there that don't do consultations and don't get on phone calls. And if they're not going to take the time to do that, then it tells you a little bit about how much time you're going to get once you hire them, in, in my opinion. Um, so if you can have conversations and see whether or not this person's going to mesh well with you in terms of personalities, come to the phone call with a list of questions. What's important to you? What do you want to accomplish? What are you worried about? You know, what kind of concerns might you have? And we can talk a little bit about some of the questions to ask on this podcast as well. Um, but that's what I would start with is, you know, first of all, narrowing down your candidates, um, talking to some of the people they coach, and then talking to them directly. And as you talk about that, I, you know, for those not everybody knows our personal life, and in fact, few people do. Uh, but we have engaged a coach, and recently, hi Sam, if you're if you're listening um, or or viewing. And so when we engaged this coach, and by we I mean mostly you, because you were the one who who researched it and found this person for us that really resonated. Um, so what you just detailed, I can assure everybody that it's not a do as I say, not as I do. It is a do as I say because. Um, I saw you uh, research this for days, and I don't know how many cumulative hours you put into this, but you put a, a lot of time into it, and we were searching for a specific aspect uh, of a coach, and in the end, what ultimately landed you on Sam that we selected was 
how she interfaced with you and the connection that you felt with her and the affinity that you felt with her. And, you know, everybody's going to be looking for something different. And I know you get this from time to time uh, in consultations is some people want a drill sergeant. Um, some people want somebody who's nurturing and compassionate. Some people want a combination of those two. Um, and everybody's need is going to be a little bit different. And again, in keeping with this philosophy that there is no one way. There are multiple ways. You need to search for the right way for you. And I, I think of it as a continuum. There's a right way and a wrong way. But somewhere in between those is going to be your way. So figure out what works best for you. As we talk about this concept of coaching, um, I think it, for me, it always bleeds into a, a larger topic of mentoring, leadership, uh, and, and just interaction and connection because they're all related. Uh, what coach that you see in the National Football League is not a mentor, is not a leader? Um, what military uh, leaders did I see, commanders in the, in the Army that I, that I was fortunate enough to work with and work, work under um, that were also not coaches and mentors uh, to me? Some people I've never met that I consider, uh, I'm a huge Brene Brown fanboy, and I consider Brene to be one of my biggest, biggest coaches because uh, I read uh, what she, how she portrays things really resonate with me. I love that so much. I love that you brought up that, yeah, we, I recently decided I'm all about growth. So I wanted a performance coach. I wanted somebody who's going to push me out of my comfort zone and, and, and challenge me. And so, you know, I did come to the table looking for certain qualities where I felt like someone who resonates, who, you know, can call me on my BS and that kind of thing. So for me, you know, those things were important. Um, when coming to hiring a coach for a bodybuilding competition, some of the same things apply. Um, does this person motivate you? Do they inspire you? Are they willing to teach you? Do you have a lot to learn? Um, I, I do have a, quite a few people that I coach that are coaches themselves. So they come in with a different level of knowledge than maybe somebody who's brand new to the fitness world. So they're going to need something a little bit different. So it's really defining what are those things that you need. If you're new to the bodybuilding world, you really need a teacher, somebody who's going to take the time and be willing to let you know why you're doing what you're doing, how to execute properly on it, um, whether that be the training, you know, in terms of the exercises, how to properly track your food. Um, whereas if you're coming in, you know, at an advanced level, um, you may need somebody who understands how the organization works. Um, you know, what shows are going to be best for you to get in front of the right judges so that you can have the best chance at your pro card. Um, or if you're a pro already, you know, who's going to know, you know, what timing for shows is going to be good for you and, you know, help you to get feedback from the judging panels. So I think that it's really important. These are these are the kinds of questions, depending on where you are in your journey and what's important to you at that stage, um, to really be able to drill and ask the person on the consultation, you know, how many times a week are we going to be able to check in? Are you going to answer my questions if it's not a check-in day? Um, you know, on show day, are you going to be able to be at my show? Or, you know, how will we be in contact? Um, are you going to help me with my stage presence and my posing? You know, what's included? You need to understand that because if, for example, posing is not included, well, now you are going to have to also budget for someone else to do that piece of the puzzle for you. So having everything listed, um, the nutrition, the training, uh, the stage presence, the overall look, the posing, you know, really having all of those things defined and listed ahead of time and understanding how is this particular coach going to approach with you each of those things and does it make sense to you? Yeah. And, and I want to back up just a little bit and talk about our selection of a coach and just the ego that potentially is involved in that. And, and we are big believers in this concept that all the best leaders are lifetime learners. And part of that is founded on our experience, but also in people that have motivated us and that we have seen be lifetime learners and approach life with you know, that, that curiosity. Uh, there was a show that we used to watch on Showtime. Uh, I, I, I think it's still maybe on about a couple's uh, counselor, um, marriage counselor in New York. I think it was in New York. And as a psychiatrist or psychologist, a psychologist I think she was, um, she worked with these couples and they were intimate sessions of, that 
basically pulled back the curtain and let you see everything that those couples were going through. And one of the things that I found interesting, and I think you found it interesting mm-hmm. too, is that she had yeah. her own uh, coach, her own psychologist. She was very successful, the psychologist, but she also needed a way and an outlet to learn and to help her be a better coach. So I do think that there's an aspect of this that when you're a coach and you're a high-performing individual, period, believing that you do not need any more help or there's nothing left to learn, um, I, I think that you're just closing the door on what truly brought you to the point that you are, which is you got there by being curious. You got there by seeking knowledge. You got there by gaining experience. You got there by enlisting the help of others. Um, and you know that one of my big beliefs in this world has been that great accomplishment accomplishments are not made by great individuals, they are made by great teams. And so when you think about the teams that have catapulted you or supported you through your journey, um, I think about, you know, my mother and father in particular, and we've had a lot of talks about that, but uh, I owe everything to my mother and father. The love that they gave me, the support that they gave me, the, the things that they did to help foster my own learning and my own development through a lot of failures and a lot of um, things that I'm not, I'm a, I'm a little bit ashamed of that in, in my past, but they were there the whole time. Um, where I am today is, uh, is a, is attributable to your support and what you've done for me and how you've always been there for me and how our kids have been there too. And, and the people around us. So I, I think that in this notion of selecting a coach, it's, it's that, belief in that finding somebody that's going to fill the needs that you have and be there for you when you need them. I love that you went there with the family discussion because I feel like the coach is the first piece of the puzzle that we wanted to talk about um, in terms of setting yourself up for success if you're wanting to go down this journey um, of of bodybuilding, whether you're new or, or you've been doing this for a while. And I feel like, you know, that next piece is completing your support structure. Um, You really need those people closest to you on board with you as you go on the journey to be, you know, very successful. And let's just be real, not everybody's going to be supportive. There are going to be some people that don't understand the lifestyle. They don't understand why you're doing what you're doing. So figuring out how are you going to handle those situations as well. I think those are really important items to set yourself up for success. So those people that are very supportive and you let them know, you know, why you're doing what you're doing um, and why it's important to you. And they're on board, you know, really leaning into those people. And then some of the people that might not be So on board, you know, finding ways to work around that, Um, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but maybe it's a little bit more limited communication during the times where you're a little more sensitive because you're in prep and things like that. Um, Or it's just, you know, not you don't have to bring it up. It doesn't even have to be an in your face sort of thing um, with people if they don't understand or like or agree with the lifestyle. Um, Even if you're not competing, I feel like sometimes somebody will go on a fitness journey and maybe their spouse doesn't want to exercise or doesn't want to diet. And so maybe they're, you know, tripping the other person up or adding some uh, temptation or just not being supportive. And it it is like swimming upstream. Um, You know, one of the things that you know, when the naysayers come out, you know, I feel like the best thing is just to add fuel to the fire. You know, it's just that much more. I want to show you that I'm going to do this, that I can follow through, that this is something that's meaningful to me. Um, so if you can use it as fuel for your fire, awesome. If you need to create a little bit more space and boundaries, that's okay too. Um, and then really lean into the support structure. But, you know, I feel like that coach needs to kind of be at the the center of that support structure. So you need a coach that's going to believe in you, that's going to support you, that's going to, um, when you fall down, that you feel comfortable letting them know I made a mistake, and then they're going to help you course correct. It's not about beating you up. It's about holding you accountable, and it's about helping you provide you with tools so that you can continue on and do better. And you made me, you made, you reminded me of a story that you told me that at some point when you were uh, working in the entrepreneurial space with your father, um, he was, and you were pursuing fitness as well. He was not as supportive of that at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I think your approach to that, well, I won't, I'll tell you, my my impression of it was that you shielded him from certain things, um, told him what he needed to know or what you were willing to tell him. Um, 
but that did I did I say that correctly? By the way, did I? Yeah, about you, how you approach that absolutely. Okay. And and for him, it was a worry because he saw me changing, yeah. and especially during the prep part of the process where I was losing weight um, and looking leaner, thinner, then he would get concerned. And it was just a matter of not really understanding what I was doing. So some of that's you know was patience. And it's funny because now he's you know like one of my biggest fans, and you know he does his physical therapy at his you know his personal training gym, and you know the people are all excited about it and everything and he understands it better but you know having that patience and then also I just didn't put it in his face all the time because you know when he saw me doing extra cardio or you know weighing my food or certain things that were you know would trigger some concern like you know is this is this a problem um, now he realizes no that was just part of my process to get ready for stage um, but it, it took some years and so we have to be patient with those around us not everybody's going to understand our passion and and i do you know it's as, as we talk about this in particular when we talk about selection of a coach and you went over some really good principles on this and also building your support network one of the things that i think we see is probably the most important thing beyond beyond you know are, are, do you vibe with this person do do you know can you communicate with them are you motivated by them those are all very important at the root of those at the very base of those there's got to be a level of trust mm -hmm. and 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 you know there's something called the performance aligned leadership model and it's just a pyramid that talks about high performance at the very top but how do you get to the top of that pyramid and at the bottom of the pyramid is trust and above that is communication. So if we talk about trust and communication, I think in today's world, um, when I say today's world, I don't know, I don't remember the phrase or term psychological safety being around uh, 30 years ago. It probably was, and it may have been, and I was not aware of the research regarding that. But I do know there's a lot of work uh, recently gone into that space of psychological mm -hmm. safety. Do you feel safe enough to be vulnerable to talk to your coach about those things and you know the analogy that we always talk about is is that if you go into the doctor and you have a pain and you don't tell the doctor about that pain um, well are you not telling them about that because you're ashamed of that and if you're ashamed of that um, is there not psychological safety or trust in that relationship that you have with your physician? So in the coaching world, and, and that's why I say this applies to everything. This applies to do you trust your manager at work? Do you trust your spouse? Do you trust your kids? Do you trust your friends? Where is that trust level with them, each one of those areas, and do you feel like you can expose your soul? Because to get to your goals and objectives, if you're not willing to, to trust your coach and tell them what you're experiencing, what you're feeling, what you're, what you're going through, how far can you get? I agree. And, you know, one of the things that ties really well into this is, um, you know, being honest with yourself and being honest with your coach is something what we're talking about. When I say be honest with yourself, um, I feel like a lot of people will watch a show or see competitors that they know and I want to do that and then there's this sense of urgency to get right to the stage versus being honest with myself and saying hey I need to put in some a little bit more work in time and building muscle first so that once I do prep and and cut down that you know that I'm able to be successful in what I'm doing um, so you do want your coach especially and and those around you because you're going to go a lot of people will go into the gym and everybody's like oh are you competing tomorrow you look so good mm. um and you know looking good when you're working out in the gym and then looking good on stage in a, in a competition suit are two completely different things so understanding that there's you know there's a balance and symmetry component there's a component of do i have enough muscle um you know a lot of times people have a great shape but maybe there's not the underlying muscle or there's not balance maybe they have great shoulders and they walk in the gym and everybody's like oh my goodness you look so great your shoulders are so great but maybe they don't have enough legs or glutes or or whatever so you know having the ability to be honest with yourself and then also have somebody who's not in a mean way. And I think that's really an important aspect of it, but being being honest with you, hey, here's the areas that you need to work on. Here's how much time I think you, know, you should give it and then start at that point deciding when you wanna get on stage. Well, I'm gonna ask you, I wanna come back to a question of what do you tell 
athletes who say that, oh, I only progress when when somebody's hard on me, when they criticize me, when they're when they're just brutal, brutal with me. Uh, I want to get back to that. But before I do that, I'm sorry, I didn't want to lose that thought. I, it just what you were talking about just reminded me a lot about being a parent. And we talked about this a lot with our kids is that and parenting is coaching. <laughs> You're coaching your kids. Uh, and we talked a lot about how you know, when you think about the time that you have with your kids versus the time that they are influenced by social media, by their friends, by the TV, um, by all those other all those other things, if you were to like put that in a pie chart, you might have a sliver of that time. And the same is true with coach and and the bikini bodybuilding industry is that you're not your coaching going to be with you every day. You have got to execute. But how does your I, 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 I'm just curious about that in, in terms of, I, I don't think we've ever talked about this, but how do, you, how do you go about having that influence when you're not there? Wow, that's a great question. I mean, it really is that self-discipline and accountability. I do think that there are tools that can be really helpful. I mean, we use a training app that allows the athlete to put their workouts in as they're getting them complete and even log reps and sets and things like that um, to also add in the other things that they're doing, their cardio, their stretching, um, their posing. I mean, there's there are those opportunities to have some checklists for accountability, which, which we utilize a lot of those. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a certain level of personal accountability that has to take place. Um, otherwise, there's not going to be success. And, and this is one of those sports where it's really a consistency over time sort of thing. If you have one great week, two great weeks, then one not so great week, you can undo, you know, a lot of the progress that you've made. So, you know, getting to the place where there's that discipline and um, it, it truly is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it bleeds into every aspect of our lives. So figuring out how to manage it is is the key. I, and so now let's come back to that other that other question that I asked because I I, I really struggle with that um, with a lot. Um, I have uh, my military experience afforded me an opportunity to be a trainer, and um, in that training was very uh, military training is very clear is that hey we're there to kind of wipe away. <laughs> whatever you are as an individual and rebuild you and remake you into a team player and into a leader and into somebody who's going to be part of something bigger than themselves. So that that's the nature of military training. And it is also one that's very hard. Um, you can go to any YouTube channel and pull up military training and you're going to see some of it. And it's a, it, it, and it's evolved over, over time, but it's still pretty much that way. I really struggle with an athlete who tells me that they want me to be they they want me to be the drill sergeant. They want me to be hard. They want me to be uh, unfeeling, un, almost uh, un, almost uncaring that they thrive. And I I did have an athlete who told me told me this exact thing is that I thrive on being told that I'm that I'm not good enough. I thrive by, by being told that I can't do things, and which I think is a different thing. But I, I basically I thrive on on somebody criticizing me or, or cutting me down, and I I don't know how to deal with that. I think that's a great question. When I'm doing consults with athletes and figuring out which coaches to pair them with, that, that's actually one of the questions I ask them is what they respond better to. Um, I do feel like each person's so individualized when it comes to what they need to help motivate them. And I think there's a way to be a little bit stricter without um, being mean or putting people down. I think we have to be very careful in this bodybuilding world where it's about an aesthetic of your body, which can be very personal. And so um, it's something I'm very cautious of. You know, we've seen people, um, you know, kind of go into, you know, eating disorder mode or um, body dysmorphia mode. Um, and I, I feel like some of that can come from the stinking thinking or the, you know, the negativity that's, that's, you know, pushed their way. So I'm very cautious personally, when it comes to that. Um, I do think that we want to have a, a, a positive self image and we also need to be reasonable. And, and that's the thing about being honest with yourself. I mean, if a coach says, Hey, you just don't have enough size right now, or, you know, you, you know, your, your physique isn't as balanced as we wanted. I don't think those things are, you know, personal attacks. I know there's, I've heard of coaches, you know, saying, you know, just kind of, oh, you're, 
you know, you're not good enough, you're not, you know, those kind of things. That to me, there's no benefit in that. Um, and when people internalize those types of personal attacks, it may motivate them in the short run because they really want the approval of this person. And so they're going to push really hard and see if they can get the approval of this person. But I feel like people that approach things that way, a lot of times don't give the other side of the feedback. So eventually it starts tearing the self-confidence down. And I've seen this. I mean, I've seen this with, with women that have come to me and, you know, it's a whole rebuilding process of even getting them to believe in themselves mm -hmm. and seeing themselves as beautiful. Um, it's one of the things I've told some of these ladies when they're taking it home to their husbands or their partners and and you know constantly talking about you know how they don't look good or they're fat or they're this or they're that and you know the question I always ask them is like are you really wanting to convince the person that thinks you're the most beautiful person in the world that you're not stop <laughs> stop doing that that's a very bad idea <laughs> um so I do think that you know those kinds of things over time can really chip away at um a person's just joy for life. So I'm very cautious when it comes to that. And I think we can separate out calling people and holding them accountable going, hey, you can do better. I know you didn't give 100% this week. Then I've seen you do better than that. So there, you know, I feel like there's a way to be a little bit more strict and, 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 and hold a person's feet to the fire without it being a personal attack, which is what I have a big issue with. Well, and, and you're getting into this uh, a little bit of the topic of growth versus fixed mindset um, in terms of how you're coached in that growth or fixed mindset. Um, I also think um, as we talk about this, there's, there's a difference between what you think motivates you and what actually produces the results. Um, and I think that some people celebrate that criticism and, and that that kind of beast mode mentality of, yeah, you can tell me I suck and I'm just going to prove you wrong or something. And I, I think there's a difference between that and what you're describing, which is telling somebody, look, you can be better. I know you can be better. And as we've, you know, we've had how many athletes tell us that the biggest difference that was made for them was having a coach that believed in them. Um, and so I think at the very end of it, uh, you've got to have somebody that believes in you and your potential. And you've also got to be reasonable in terms of your goals and objectives. Um, you know, if I, if I were to come out and say today, hey, I want to be Mr. Olympia. Um, well, gosh, I'm in my fifties and almost going to be in my sixties. And I, you know, I, I, I don't weigh that amount. I have not been putting on that muscle for the years and years that it would take. So is that a reasonable goal for me? Pro it's, it's not, I, I'm not going to say it's probably not. It is not a reasonable goal for me. And so if I were to consult a coach and say, Hey coach, um, I, I want you to coach me because I want to be Mr. Olympia. Um, I would expect and, and want to have a coach who say, you know, that's not a realistic goal for you. Um, let's talk about what is a realistic goal for you and what are achievable objectives for you to get to get to that goal that we can agree on. But I, I do think there's an aspect of this that does require that introspection. And to that end, it's getting a coach who helps you um, I love that analogy you give about uh, leadership training that we, we've talked about, which is wiping the wiping the, the steam off the mirror to see yourself. I think that part of that is a coach's responsibility to help you look inside yourself. At the end of the day, the coach is a facilitator, the, co the same as a mentor or any leader for that matter. Um, a, a leader, and I always go with the uh, Army definition of leadership, which is the process of influencing others by providing purpose, direction, and motivation to accomplish a mission and improve an organization. And yes, that's straight out of FM 6-22 uh, for those who, who are fact-checking me. Um, but that definition of leadership I think about as coaches is that as a coach, my job is to influence you. And my job is to help you with your purpose, your why. My job is to help you with your motivation and your direction and then to map out a course. You'll have to walk that, but my job is to create a space where you can share everything, where you can be your, your true and authentic self and then help you accomplish the objectives that we agree upon collectively or together. I love that. And, you know, I think setting your goals and setting reasonable goals is important. Um, if you're new to competing and you and I have both had this where we'll do a consult with somebody who's never competed before and their goals already something about the Olympia. And it's like, whoa, let's put one foot in front of the right. other here. Um, and I think if if somebody promises 
something, um, you know, another, another example would be, you know, if I have somebody that's coming to me and I know they're going to need to lose 50 pounds and they want to compete in 10 weeks, if, if a coach tells you they could do that run because they're not going to do that in a healthy way, um, you're not going to have a good experience either with the prep nor with the results at the end of it. So I think that a huge part of it is, is getting that education. What is reasonable? You know, what's a reasonable time frame? What am I looking to accomplish in that time frame? Um, I know that you talk a lot about goals and objectives and, you know, the difference between the two. And, um, you know, th that's a really important thing, you know, as you're embarking on a goal, whether you be whether it be a body bodybuilding goal or another goal, or if it's your first show ever, or it's your you know fiftieth show, and you're you know you've been working for that pro card, is to to be really clear on you know is my goal reasonable? Am I giving myself adequate time to accomplish it? Um, am I am I doing it in a healthy way? Am I taking the right steps to help with with longevity? Um, you know, I mean, I, I talk about this frequently. Is that that you know, for me and my experience in competing is that the biggest, my biggest takeaway, my biggest thing of value is the relationships. I made some incredible friendships, some incredible relationships. I had, you know, any trophy that I got or placing that I got are, are so secondary now that I look back on it to what I gained in terms of building my confidence, building my um, belief in myself, um, and the the amazing relationships that I made along the way. So, you know, making sure that it's not just about a trophy, it's not just about a placing, that you're looking at the bigger picture, you're setting goals that align with, you know, you know, your deeper why, your deeper, you know, set of values. And and I think we we will talk about some of these concepts in future episodes. But I do know that you know one of our philosophies, core philosophies, is compete for the feedback. Because uh, and what does Jamie say? It's bodybuilding, not body built. So if you're in the sport of bodybuilding, then you are in and want to be in the mindset of continuous improvement. How do I get better every show? Well, the way to get better every show is not necessarily to get a trophy. It's to get the feedback and then to figure out what did I put on stage? How did I put that on stage? And then how do I get to the next best expression of myself on that stage? Um, which I, I think is the same in, is true in life is that um, when you're when you're working on improving yourself, part of that improvement is going to be fraught with failure. Um, and those, fa but failure is the greatest teacher. And when you have those lessons of failure, are you able to then translate those into lessons that you can push forward? Um, I want to, in this last little bit here, you hit on something that I really wanted to go back to because um, health uh, and a coach who is going to protect your health. Uh, I know we take that obligation very seriously. Um, I am not, I am never going to do anything that is going to compromise somebody's health. Um, it's not a question of can you do this? Um, it's a question of should you do this? And in that mindset, I do think that some athletes are willing to say, I, I don't care what it takes. I will do anything to get to this goal. But in so doing, they are putting their health at risk and their future at risk. And that's just something we don't do. I, I I totally agree, and you know it's interesting in a an area that is all about health and fitness that you know a lot of times people do get into that mentality, and it doesn't need to be that way, and it might mean it takes you a little bit longer, you know, to build a little bit more muscle, or you need to take a little bit longer for your prep in order to give yourself time to pull that body fat off in a way that's a little bit less um, intense, and you know, listening to your body along the way is so crucial and giving that feedback to your coach, taking those things into account, being willing to respond. You know, I, I always tell people that, um, you know, as far as like doing a refeed or a deload week, those kinds of things, I'm basing those off of the biofeedback I'm getting from you rather than just randomly, you know, putting them out there. I want to know, hey, I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm recovering as well. Um, my energy has been declining. My strength isn't where it was. Okay, we need to take a little bit of a, a deload week. Let's take a little bit of pressure off. Let's let that body recover. Let's make sure we're in a good spot and then we'll continue on. 
you know? So the things that our bodies are telling us have a reason, they're important. Um, getting regular, you know, doctor's visits, checkups, blood work done, making sure that we're optimizing health always. It's, it's, it should be the, the cornerstone of everything you're doing, um, whether you're going to compete or not. You know, like this, this, we get one body for this lifetime, you know, and, you know, I know a lot of times, you know, in our younger years, we think we're invincible and, you know, we can just do whatever and it's not going to matter. And, and we're in our fifties and we can promise you it all matters. So, you know, so really make that your cornerstone, no matter what. And so again, kind of wrapping it around to that, finding a coach is that, is that coach that you're talking? Are they going to, are they going to put your health first? Yeah. Are they going to educate you? Are they going to make sure that, you know, that you're making that your cornerstone in everything you do going forward and then from there to me is is make sure it's fun yeah make sure you're having fun guys like this is a hobby for most of us it's you know it's something it needs to be fun um it's not a race you know like you said bodybuilding not body built there's it doesn't matter if you're number one in the world you're still looking for ways to improve but this industry and this is no different than corporate world or corporate america because i spent there too uh is that we, it's a microwave culture. And the microwave culture, we expect that I can put something in the microwave for 30 seconds and it's going to be fully baked. And people want to get to that next level without putting in the work or the time and having a coach that's there to help them along that way. And so um, and I, I'm quoting, I think, the quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles who said, um, keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is always going to be health. So and as nothing we, tastes as good out that, of the microwave. That's 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 hundred percent true. So as we as we kind of kind of capture this this episode, in selecting a coach, the things that we really encourage you to do is one: make sure you can get on a consult with that coach. Do your research. Think research is number one. Well, no, I'm sorry. You started out with a, a really better number one, which is: do you need a coach? Make that decision. Do you need a coach? Do I want a coach? Is a coach going to help me get to that to the next best expression of me? Second would be: do your research. Third would be get on a consult call, and if they don't give a consult call, that's a that's a straight that's a straight negative response. And then after that, we get into a, a, a few things about what resonates with you, what what do you feel comfortable with. But at the end of the day, there's got to be trust. You've got to be able to communicate with them in an acceptable format for you and for them, and you've got to be able to have that safe space where you can be you because if you're not you're not going to reach those goals and objectives and, and you're it, not going to have fun doing it and you're not going to have fun and that's the last thing have fun yeah okay we hit them all i think we hit them all all right well we will see you all on or hear you all or be with you all on our next episode and thank you for tuning in Thank you for tuning in to Fit Body Lifestyle. We hope today's episode has left you feeling motivated and equipped to tackle your fitness goals, business challenges, and the daily dance of life. Remember to value progress over perfection. Life's tough enough alone. Find the chosen family around you to help you along the way. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite streaming platform. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Fit Body Fusion.